The message of grace is brought to you by Christian people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and who appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there's a God-given design for its study. Rightly divided, the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us for an interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, President of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join him now. We're certainly glad you joined us today. We do trust that our time together in God's Word will be a rich blessing and help to you. We're going to look again into the pages of the Scripture and allow the Spirit of God to teach us out of His Word. You know, when you go to the Bible, one of the, one of the great demands of the law of God found in the Scripture is that men would love God with all their heart. In fact, the very first two of the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt have no other goddess before me. Thou shalt not make any graven images uh, those, th those two commandments demonstrate the exclusivity of God's position. God told Israel, you'll have no other gods. I'm a jealous God. Now, you know, jealousy, when we think of jealousy, we think of it as a, as a, as a negative emotion, as something we shouldn't have. But there is a good jealousy, and God has it. God is passionate about the exclusivity of his relationship with his people. Have nobody in front of me. In fact, in Matthew chapter 22, one of them, verse 35, which was a lawyer, asked Jesus a question, tempting him, saying, Master, what is the great commandment in the law? Now, you know it would be a lawyer trying to do that trying to catch him, ask a great philosophical dis question that's been, you know, would be, would be able to be debated and discussed through the ages. What is the great commandment of the law? You'll notice that our Lord doesn't bat an eye, doesn't hesitate. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What a statement. The great commandment, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the second Love your neighbor as yourself. Those two commandments sum up everything the law tells you. Paul says in, in Romans 13 the, the, that love is the fulfillment of the law, for love, for love works no ill to his neighbor. That's it. Don't have anything before God. Give that exclusive position to him that he deserves. And then be more interested in the, in the interests and the, and the good of others than you are yourself. That is, think like God thinks. God told Israel, Deuteronomy chapter 6, the great commandment came from this passage in Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. That's it. That's the, that's the essence of, uh, of, of what God requires. If you go to the book of Micah, there's a great statement in Micah chapter, chapter number 6. Where, where God describes the... The same kind of thing. Micah says to Israel, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? 
every philosophy of the world, every religious tenet of, of, of enlightened man reaches no higher than that. And that call to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself is written into the conscience of every human. Romans chapter 2, verse 14. The Apostle Paul says, When the Gentiles which have not the law... God never gave the law contract to the Gentiles. He gave that exclusively to the nation Israel. He revealed His Word, Himself, His laws, His thinking exclusively to Israel. Now Israel got that blessed position so they could be the channel of that information to the Gentiles. But even though he didn't give it to the Gentiles, Paul says, For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law or a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law, listen, written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. There is that intuitive, moral awareness of what God requires, and He wrote it in the hearts of every man. That's why a philosopher of old made the statement, there's a God-shaped vacuum in every person. Now, he wanted to fill it with something else <laughs> than the grace of God. But you see, God wrote that. God fixed it. That's why Psalm 14, verse 1, lets the cat out of the bag for the atheist. Psalm 14, 1 says, the, For the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. When you read the great atheist of the world and the great atheist of our generation, it's not science. It's not philosophy. It's not reason that drives them to be atheist. Oh, I've read their books, but I've read the book on them. Psalm 14, verse 1, tells you something about their heart that even they don't know. Why don't they know it? Jeremiah 17, verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who, sh who can know it? Your heart will deceive you to get its way. Believe the lie program. Worship and serve the creature more than the, than the Creator. The fool says in his heart, who's a fool? Jesus said, oh fool, and slow of heart to believe all that the Scripture has said to you. The fool says in his heart there's no God. The reason his head comes to that conclusion by misinterpreting science or philosophy or enlightenment is because his heart already has the conclusion ahead of time and knows what it wants. Psalm 63, verse number 1. O oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and, and thirsty land where water, where there is no water. That's the panting. That's the looking of the heart after God. Needing Him, desiring Him, and unable to find Him. Well, when God says, love the Lord thy God, and by the way, loving God, Jesus said in John chapter, oh, what is it, oh, 14, verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. <laughs> you see, that's it's the, it's, it's the heart and the true mark of a believer. Can I tell you that when God says the first commandment is to love the Lord thy God, it's not because he needs you to love him, by the way. It's not because he needs anything from us. It's because 
He has something for us. You see, and I want to get this clear in your, in your thinking about loving God. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter number 4. When you think about loving God, you, 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 one verse you need to remember is 1 John chapter 4. Because it, what John tells us here, 1 John 4 verse number 8, He that loveth not, he that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. In this was manifest the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. You see, we love Him because He loved us. That's what verse 19 says. We love Him not because He told us to. Because the fact is, you don't love Him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. You don't love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, people have taken that verse and turned it into a devil's brew by saying, well, see, you need to love yourself so you can love your neighbor. No, no, no. You already love yourself. You already put yourself above everything else. You already think you're number one. When you hear this message, well, you know, God has this wonderful plan for your life. God loves you. Your first thought is, well, He's pretty smart. I love me too. He loves me. I'm, well, I'm, he's a pretty smart guy. Got a plan for me. I got a plan for me too. I, I, this, that's a Jesus I might could, you know, hang around with. But the fact is, you're a sinner. You've come short of the glory of God. You don't love Him as you ought to love Him. You've fallen way short. And God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, John chapter 4, verse uh, 12, when He says, Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and gave Himself to be a propitiation for us. That's where the love of God is manifested. At the cross. God commended His love toward us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He asked the question in John 4, If a man say, I love God, and hate his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? To love God when you haven't seen Him demonstrates that love is more than just a physical attraction. It's, it's something on a spiritual level. It's something on a thinking level. That's when He says, here in His love. What, where is it? Not that we loved Him. Not that we were trying to please Him, not that we were trying to gain His affection, not that we were putting His interest ahead of ours, but that He loved us. And that He gave His only begotten Son to be the propitiation, the fully satisfying sacrifice, the one who would completely and totally pay for everything that's wrong with me. He commended His love and that while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me, for you. Herein is love. That's where real love is. When someone would love you enough to give everything up for your benefit. That's the love of God. 
And that's why Paul says it's the love of Christ that constrains me. You see, the law says, love me. That's a worthy goal. The problem is we don't do it. Written down in your heart is the moral imperative to love God. But your heart wants to love itself chooses to love itself, in fact chooses to make itself God so it has someone it can love that it wants to love. You talk about screwed up, confused, mixed up. That's where we are outside of Christ. Foolish, Titus says, and disobedient, hateful and hating one another. But it starts out with being foolish. The fool has said in his heart, there's no God. No God out yonder. I'll take his place. So the love of God is God loving me. The love of Christ is Christ loving me. The love of Christ constrains us. Look, look over at 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. See, there's all this talk about loving God, knowing Him and loving Him. The problem is you fail. You want to succeed? Quit looking at you and your capacity and look to Him. And learn to love Him because He first loved you. Learn to let the love of Christ constrain you. To do what? To love Him back. Our love is that gratitude, that response, that reflex to the greatness of His love to us. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us. I always love that word constrained. It's the idea of putting your arms around someone, picking them up, and walking off with them. You constrain them, possess them, he came along and he put everlasting arms of love around us, picked us up, and carries us off across the bow of an eternal summer of his presence. The love of Christ constrains me. It isn't me trying to work up the compulsion to do something. It isn't me figuring out how to fulfill my duty. It's me, in spite of every failure that I have, every limitation, on my part, relaxing into the arms of His love and just enjoying being loved. That's what Ephesians, accepted in the beloved. Has it ever really dawned on you that you are, that you be loved by God with a passion, with a fury? that's beyond imagination. Now here's how the love of Christ constrains you. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge. There is a thinking process that leads you to have the love of God be the thing that constrains your life. Because we thus judge. Here's what's going to grip and motivate you. That if one died for all, then we're all dead. Well, Paul said the gospel is how that Christ died for our sins. If he died for everybody, it's because everybody needed a Savior. He didn't die for you because you could almost make it yourself. He died for you because you couldn't even get there with the help of ten men. Because you were dead. You understand, dead means dead, unable to perform. If he died for all, it's because everybody was dead. The wages of sin is death. The only answer to sin is death. So Christ died. You heard the story about the fellow who's laid out in the coffin? His friends come by and 
look at him and say, you know, George, you don't look so good. I think you need some vitamins. Put some vitamins in the coffin with him. The other one says, George, you know, you never were very religious and you're going to go meet God. You, you need a little religion. So stick a Bible in the coffin with him. Another guy says, George, you know what you need? You need some education. So they bring a little sleep learning MP3, stick it under his pillow and play the encyclopedia tapes to it. Right, you know, that's going to do him any good. Another guy says, you need, you need money. Writes him a check, puts it in there. It'd be, be, be real, more real if you put in a $100 bill in there, but he'd write a check. Isn't that thinking that's going to do any good? I know I heard about the... No, it won't. Why? George is dead. Religion, education, money, you name it. Not going to do him any good. He's dead. You know how Christ died for you? You were dead. You were cut off. Now, somebody said, I, I remember hearing about, about uh, some guy standing around the coffin of their buddy, and one guy says, what do you, when, you're, when you're in your coffin, what would you like people to say about you? One guy says, well, I'd like them to look at me in the coffin and say, well, he was a good family man, took care of his family. The other guy says, I'd like him to say that he was a, he was a good community man, you know, help people in the community. And they look back at their friends and say, what would you like to say? He said, I'd like people to look in the coffin and say, he's alive, he's alive. <laughs> because that's really the only answer to death. Okay? But the fact is, he died for everybody because everybody needed somebody to die for them because they're all dead. That's your problem. Dead people can't do anything. You, there's nothing you can do to gain God's favor. Christ knew that. You were helpless, hopeless. And in that he died for all, that they which live. So you can move from being a dead person to a live person. He's alive, he's alive. How? The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So he died for everybody so that he then could give life to those that would trust him. that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that loved them and died for them. He died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that died for them and rose again. You get that? You see, the whole motivation for the living and the serving and the unto him is what? Not to get something from him, not to get favor, not to get blessing, but it's the life that he gave us just living itself out through us. And it constrains us. There's a story back in Luke chapter 7. It's always been very touching. Jesus tells about the lady. Luke chapter 7 that came and was a great sinner. And the text said she had nothing to pay. Nothing to pay. And she came and the disciples got mad at her. When she stood at Jesus' feet, wept, washed his feet with her tears. And so Jesus talked to them about that. Then he asked them the question, her sins, which were many, are forgiven, for she loved much. Who's going to love more, the one to whom a lot's forgiven, or to whom a little is forgiven? The one for whom much is forgiven. When you learn to relax and enjoy being loved by God, Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 15, Verse number 10. But by the grace of God I am what I am. And His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. For I, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. 
You see, no, you don't deserve being loved. And yes, you're going to abuse it. Because you didn't deserve it to start with. That's what makes it more amazing. There's not one failure that you, 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 you experience. There's not one abuse that you heap upon God's love that he didn't know about 2,000 years ago when Christ died for them. And in your experience of being loved by this passionate love, this furious passion of God to have you as his, called Calvary. It makes that love so amazing. But that's also what makes it transforming. Because we love him. Because he first loved us. Hebrews 12 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame to sit down at the right hand of the Father on high, who for the joy that was set before him, the joy of having you and me as his own, bought possessions, bought with a price. He endured the cross for you. Could I say, enter into the joy of the Lord. Trust him. Trust Him to receive His forgiveness and His life. And then having trusted Him and received His life, been born into His family, trust Him every day that He's still enough. And let Him be the treasure that you cherish above all things. Love Him because He first loved you. Till next time, Maranatha.